Okay, guys, this is Transferal by Kate Blair, Chapter 2. Just a reminder, I'm not doing any editing, so if I pause, I apologize. Occasionally, there's the odd interruption, but I will just keep going after that. Okay, so here we go. Chapter 2, St. Bart's Hospital, London, 24 days left. There's this thing called normalcy bias. Basically, we're so used to everything being okay that if something awful suddenly happens, it can take about eight seconds to clue in. That's much longer than it sounds. People die in earthquakes when they have plenty of time to get to safety. They stand there as the masonry falls around them, trying to process what is happening. I learned about normalcy bias the hard way four years ago. And now... Just like back then, I can't move. All I see is the cleaver clutched between dark brown fingers. The wide blade reflects the clean marble of the lobby. Meat cleaver. Hospital. Madman. I'm tr I try to make sense of it. The atrium springs back to life around me. Sound swelling into the vacuum of, the si of silence. Chairs scraping, voices shouting, the squeak of shoes on the polished floor, but I'm stuck staring at the black man as he lurches further into the lobby like Frankenstein's monster. My heart is jammed in my throat, cutting off my breath. I try to remember my self-defense lessons. How are you meant to defend yourself against a man with a blade the size of your head? I take a few steps back towards the cafe, trip over a chair, and stumble against the rickety table. I watched as an abandoned coffee cup, coffee tips and the brown liquid arcs through the air splashing onto the floor. The man is between me and the front doors, advancing. People are running past him. Has anyone called the police or security? Where are they? I thought there was a shoot to kill policy at hospitals. And that's when I see her, Rebecca my dead sister, come to life. She's standing behind the madman with the cleaver. Where did she come from? I feel as if a part of my brain has disconnected. I try to force the scene to make sense. Madman, Blade, Rebecca. Is history repeating itself? No, it was a gun last time. And my heart clenches. It's not Rebecca, not at all. She's about the same age, but her eyes are green, her skin darker. How could I have mistaken her? The girl cries out, and the man stops and turns to face her. You notice more details at a time like this. The glistening of sweat on the man's skin, his chest heaving, the skin crack at the threads of the floor of the foyer connecting me to the girl. I can get out now. The man's attention is fixed on the girl. I glanced around for her family. Where are they? Everyone is flowing away from the two of them, running out of the doors or up the stairs. The girl is frozen, mouth open, as the man lumbers towards her. She starts waving her arms, and I wonder what she's doing. Then I realize she's calling for help. From me. The man is close to her now. She's shouting, but I can't hear over the rush of blood in my ears. I can't let this happen again. It's time to move. He's armed. I need a weapon, too. I kick off my heels and stand steady on the smooth floor. I can save the gr this girl. It'll be different this time. Her mouth distorts as she cries out, her eyes fixed on the brute, staggering towards her. Tears gleam on her cheeks. There's no time. He's almost reached her, the cleaver tightly clasped in his right fist. My gaze falls to the cafe chairs. I lunge towards one, latch onto the metal bar at the top of the backrest. I swing it off the ground. The chair is heavy, but I have momentum on my side. My muscles stretch, but I keep my grip and careen forward, getting closer to the bulk of the man's back. The reek of him hits me before I'm even close. The animal stink of sweat and soiled clothes. 
The dark brown of his scalp shows through his thinning hair. My target. With a grunt, I swing the chair around, heaving it up as high as I can towards his skull. I close my eyes and pray it will connect. And it does. Hard. The impact knocks the chair out of my grip, and it flies off to the side. I duck as it clatters to the floor. The man falls, legs folding beneath him. His head hits the ground with a dull thump. I'm frozen in a protective half-crouch, standing still, trembling. From the, reverber the reverberation of the metal when it hits him. The man lands, face down. A trickle of blood leaks from behind his ear, pooling on the white marble. I stare, the anger evaporating. Oh God, have I killed him? But the girl is okay. She looks up at me. There are tears on her cheeks. A long moment passes between us. Before I can move, she turns and runs, out, runs for the doors. I'm about to follow when, a, when the man groans and his arms flail towards the cleaver. He's alive. I kick the blade away from him as the wail of sirens builds outside. The police station is over air conditioned. Even if it were warmer, I'd still be shaking. At least I have something, it, something to blame it on. The shock has kicked in and goosebumps run along my skin. I jump at the raised voices, at doors slamming, even at people talking to me. The police brought me here. I gave them my name and, the, and the fir, to the first officers on the scene, and they whisked me out of there before the press got wind of it. I couldn't reach Dad. He was probably in the middle of brunch. I managed to get a hold of Pierce. I didn't make much sense, but I told him which station they were taking me to. Did you find the girl? I asked the blonde officer who has been assigned to me. She's sitting opposite me at a desk, finishing up her notes from my statements. Not yet, she gives me a sympathetic smile. The girl was gone when the police burst in. She wasn't Rebecca, didn't even look like her. It was only the shock that gave that uh, momentary illusion. She had darker skin and her face was thinner, like a little fox. But for a moment, as we stared at each other, that didn't matter. For this girl, I moved fast enough. I wasn't too late. Where could she have gone? Where was her family? We're looking into it. We'll let you know as soon as we have some information. The streets around St. Bart's aren't safe. She was scared, vulnerable. I grabbed a hold of the officer's arm. What if she wandered into the criminal slums of the Barbican? The officer looks down at where I'm holding on to her. I let go. Maybe we should take you to an interview room. It'll be safer. Keep you out of sight of the public's eye. This way. She shows me to a room with gum-stained floor and gestures towards a plastic chair. In the quiet, the adrenaline drains from my system, leaving me shaking. Would you like a cup of tea? She asks. I wanted to say yes. It's something to do with my trembling hands, at least. Something to do with my trembling hands. But instead, I burst into tears. The officer looks frightened. Are you okay? I can't stop crying. I try to say I'm fine, but it comes out in an inaudible mess of snot and tears. The officer approaches me warily and then puts her arm around me. There, there, she says, patting my back. You're safe now. I know that. I want to stop, but the blubbering continues, accompanied by back-shaking sobs. She must think I'm so pathetic. Finally, I'm able to get myself under control and stop the tears. We stand awkwardly for a moment, her arms still around me, before I pull away. She looks at my face, and from her expression, I could tell it was a mess. I'm not wearing waterproof mascara. I'll get you a tissue and that cup of tea she said. Thank you so much, I manage. After she goes, I try to clean myself up a little with my sleeve, leaving black streaks across it. A few minutes later, the officer came back with my cup of tea. 
a handful of tissues, and my dad. Look who I found in the corridor, she says. She's trying to be lighthearted, but it must have been weird dealing with the man who may be your boss's 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 boss. I stand up. My father hurries over, almost knocking the tea from the policewoman's hand. He throws his arms around me and squeezes so tightly and forces the air out of me. Over Dad's shoulder, I can see Allison and Piers enter the room. Dad holds me for a minute, then pulls me, then pulls away, looking at my face. Oh, Talia, he said. Then he hugs me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, he says quietly in my ear. I should have been there again. Are you okay? Allison asks. I nod as she exhales. Thank God. I'm not hurt. I'm glad Dad didn't see me my blubbering. He's worried enough already. Hopefully, I cleared most of the wreckage of my makeup off my face. Piers is leaning on his stick and grinning at me. I've never seen him do that before. It's kind of weird. I thought he'd be mad that I pulled him away from the Knightsbridge brunch. Dad turns back to the officer, already his usual composed self. He's still pale. Maybe it was the fluorescent light. Ah, tea, he said, peering at the mug she's holding. For my daughter, I presume? He takes it from her and passes it to me. Thank you so much. I clutch it. The warmth seeps through my hands. Can I get you anything, sir? She asks, still clutch, clutching the tissues. If it isn't too much trouble, I could use a tea myself. Just a drop of milk, no sugar. My dad never remembers to eat or drink unless something is put in front of him. So I know he's trying to get rid of the policewoman politely. She practically bows on her way out. Dad waits for the door to click, uh, waits until the door has clicked and then runs to me. What were you thinking, Talia? You could have been killed. Didn't they tell you about the girl? Piers limped forward. They couldn't stop talking about it. They said you saved her life. This is going to play so well in the media. I could hug you. Seriously. Dad rounds on him. This isn't a PR stunt, Piers. He turns back to me. You should have called security to escort you out. What were you thinking? This is the second time I've almost lost you to criminals. He shakes his head. It's not safe out there. You'll fix it, I say. Maybe the whole country's safer as soon as you're prime minister. It'll take time, Talia. But you have to look after yourself. I couldn't leave the girl. She was waving to me for help. She was the same age as Rebecca. Dad stiffens. I see. Is she okay? I don't know. She ran away. We have to find her. Calm down. You're getting worked up. No, I'm not, but I'm speaking too fast. She can't have been older than nine or ten, and she was alo all alone at the hospital. Not right. It's not Rebecca. You can't bring her or your mother back. I shrug off his hands. I know that, Dad. I just need to check that she's safe. She was so frightened, so small. I gestured, forgetting about the tea that I am holding, and a wave of it sloshes over the rim and splashes on the floor. Talia, Dad says in his warning voice. He takes what remains of the tea from me and places it on the table. I'm sure the police are looking into it. I'll ask them to keep us in the loop. I want to ask for more. I want to demand that they find her, now. But a muscle in his cheek that twitches, and I know better than to push him. To my surprise, it's Piers who steps in. She's right, Malcolm. We have to find her. We'll hold a press conference tomorrow, and you can launch an appeal. I'm sure she wants to thank Talia for saving her life, and we could get two days of headlines from this, at, at least. It could be exactly what this campaign needs. Piers leans in, leans his stick against the wall, limps over, and, to my surprise, really does hug me. Dad and Allison's phones start ringing before we even leave the station. I wonder if Piers or the police or 
I wonder if it's peers or the police who leaked it. The story breaks on the lunchtime news and is the top item of the evening. I'm on the cover of most newspapers the next morning. The tabloids are having a field day with it. One calls me the hero's the hero daughter of our next prime minister. Then phones Allison and asks if I'll pose topless when I turn 18. Dad looks like he wants to punch something when she tells us. But the next evening, the polls show Dad's popularity is rising. We're back on track. I even get an interview to appear on Sharp, Marcus Sharp's show. Piers and I convince Dad to accept. I'm nervous, but it'll be a softball interview, and it could be a huge boost to Dad's campaign. If it goes well, Dad might take me on the campaign trail once Parliament dissolves. I'm suddenly an election asset, after all. But I'm agreeing because of the girl. Not, no one has come forward, not even after Dad's press conference. And now I'm worried. What a better way, what better way to find her than an appeal on a national, on national television?